Cheering crowds in the Philippines have witnessed the inauguration of a dictator's son as their president. Ferdinand Marcos Jr., also known as Bongbong Marcos, took the oath of office 36 years after his father's brutal dictatorship was ended by a people power revolt. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Republic of the Philippines, President Ferdinand Romualdez Marcos Jr. And with that, the rehabilitation of the Marcos family in the Philippines was complete. The new president praised the legacy of his father, Ferdinand Marcos, for accomplishing many things. He promised to emulate him and made his own promises to the people. We are presently drawing up a comprehensive, all-inclusive plan for economic transformation. We will build back better by doing things in the light of the experiences that we have had, both good and bad. It doesn't matter. But it does matter, especially for those that suffered under the dictatorship of the president's father. Marcos Sr.'s rule from the 70s to the mid-80s was marked by enforced disappearances, torture and police brutality. The victims number in the thousands, the families they left behind even more. And they are determined to tell younger generations about a dictator no one wanted and the lasting damage he left behind. Loved ones light candles in honor of Rizalina Ilagan. She disappeared 45 years ago during the reign of Philippine dictator Ferdinand Marcos Sr. This wall of remembrance has the names of more than 300 people who fought against the dictatorship. On what would have been Rizalina's 68th birthday, her family gathered at the wall to commemorate her courage. She fought against the dictatorship. Uh, she thought that uh, that was her obligation as a young Filipino to join the resistance movement. Rizalina's older brother Bonifacio was imprisoned for two years and tortured during Marcos' reign. He wrote articles for an underground newspaper and poetry opposing the dictatorship. Marcos Sr. ruled the Philippines from the mid-1960s to the mid-80s, almost half of it under martial law. Thousands of people were tortured, murdered, or disappeared. But now, more than three decades after Marcos was ousted, his son and namesake has become president. It's a nightmare seeing the son of the dictator become the 17th president of the Philippines. It's unimaginable. One of the reasons Marcos won the election is a massive social media disinformation campaign that whitewashed his father's record. The majority of Filipino voters were either born after the dictatorship or were too young at the time to remember it. The story of the repressive regime is barely addressed in the schools here. This small, privately funded museum is trying to fill that gap. Ira DeSoyo is about to graduate from high school. She's part of a group of students learning about the brutality of the Marcos senior regime. It's very important for me to share a lot of information to the other people, especially in my generation, because a lot of misinformation, fake news are already sp spreading across the internet or social media. Bonifacio Ilagan says survivors of the atrocities cannot give up. It is incumbent upon us to connect with the young, tell the young our stories, and encourage the young to keep up the fight. A fight to make sure what really happened in the Philippines is preserved and that history is never again repeated. But a part of it is being repeated. The dictator's son is now president. Journalist Anna Santos joins me now for more on this. Anna, Filipinos overthrew Marcos Sr.'s dictatorship in 1986, and now they have elected his son president. How? Suresh, I would explain the victory of Marcos Jr. to what I would call an unholy trinity, or the interlocking of three factors, 
The first being this massive, well-funded disinformation campaign mounted on platforms like YouTube, Facebook, and popular blogs. Now, not only are these platforms very difficult to regulate, but these are boosted through ads and algorithms that push them on our, to our feeds until they bleed into our consciousness. Secondly, there's also the, his media engagement strategy. So Marcus Jr. refused to engage in any uh, political debates uh, or um, he refused to give media interviews during his campaign. He said this was because he didn't want to cause any more fractures in the already divided society. But the only thing that it succeeded in doing was preventing journalists from questioning him critically about right. his past related to martial law or his future plans for the Philippines. And lastly, there's this political alliance with Sara Duterte, who is now the vice president. She's the daughter of President Duterte, who for the most part remained until the end a popular president. So when you look at the intersections of these three factors, it's like a master class in how you manufacture lies that look like the truth. And Bongbong Marcos also said of his father at the inauguration today, I quote, he got it done, sometimes with the needed support, sometimes without. So will it be with his son. What does that mean for Filipinos? What can they expect from Bongbong Marcos' government? I was listening to the inauguration and reviewing his transcript speech over and over again, and I saw many times that he kept up. Marcos Jr. kept on saying, we have to look to the future. We can no longer look to the past if we want to move forward as a nation. He said this many times, except when he would refer to the past achievements of his father. But I will tell you, Baresh, that it does look a lot like martial law. Over the last couple of weeks, we've seen warrantless arrests, namely of over 80 journalists, activists, and farmers who were participating in a peaceful ceremony protest. There was also the shutdown of many progressive media outlets, including uh, Budatlat and Pinoy Weekly. And just yesterday, the authorities held up its decision to close Rappler, the, no the news outlet that was founded by Nobel laureate Maria Ressa and who right. has been you know, very critical of the Duterte administration. So it looks like martial law and it feels like the last six years under Duterte. And it's quite chilling. Uh, briefly, Anna, his most immediate uh, challenge is an economy battered by COVID headwinds. He's promised to improve the situation, but how will that happen? You know, a lot of economic analysts I've been speaking to the last couple of days are wondering the same thing. And again, referencing, you know, his inauguration speech, uh, Marcus Jr. made reference to a promise for economic transformation. That's what he called it. But until now, there is no comprehensive plan for economic recovery. He did acknowledge that the economy is battered, you know, by the global pandemic, by also the war in Ukraine. But right. for something of this magnitude, we need something more concrete than a promise of just economic transformation. Anna Santos, we leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us today. Over to Southeast Asia now, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has taken office as president of the Philippines, marking a return of the country's most infamous family to its highest office. Marcos said in his inaugural address that he wanted to talk about the future, not the past. For the country's economy, that means recovery from the pandemic and the battle against inflation. His father turned the Philippines into a dictatorship where thousands were killed and tortured for opposing the government. Billions disappeared from the state coffers. Now Ferdinand Marcos Jr., who's known as Bongbong, Bong, has brought the controversial dynasty back to the highest office. The 64-year-old, who was elected president in May, will now be inaugurated. It was a clear victory, with 58% of the vote, even though some accuse him of electoral fraud. Thanks to a massive social media campaign, he succeeded in casting his father's era in a positive light among many voters, especially very young ones. He's promised growth and prosperity. Marcos is inheriting a growing economy. The government expects it to expand 7 to 9 percent this year. But while the country may be emerging from the downturn caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, Filipinos are struggling amid rampant inflation. Much like elsewhere, rising prices and energy shortages are wreaking havoc.
My colleague Janelle Dumoulin was in Manila for the, those elections. She now joins me in studio. Janelle, welcome. Marcos pushed some populist issues during this campaign, including talking about slashing the price of rice. At the same time, we've seen that with some of his appointees, they've been talking more about paying down debt, uh, continuing the growth. That doesn't sound very populist. What should we make of this? Well, his appointees have largely been technocrats that have experience in previous administrations. So not just Duterte's, but Aquino's uh, before Duterte, and they've been credited with uh, economic growth strengthening policies. As for Duterte himself, the gains and reforms that we saw during his administration were thought to have been a product of him hiring experts and then largely keeping his hands off the details. And then we get to Marcos himself. Now, you mentioned that thing he said about lowering uh, the price of rice. He has since walked back those comments. He said that's an aspiration, so that's not something that you and I can understand you as policy. You always pointed out that that was problematic from the beginning, especially for farmers, It was right? never going to work. But you know what? He's now made himself the Secretary of Agriculture. He has to put his money where his mouth is. He says he wants to set the Philippines on a path to self-sufficiency. How he's going to do that, we don't know exactly. He hasn't laid out concrete policy proposals. And that's going to be really important because the stakes are high. As you said, inflation is high. The peso is down. For a country that is a net importer, a low currency means that so many more things are unaffordable for ordinary Filipinos. He talked about paying down debt. Well, that leaves... Uh, less wiggle room when it comes to providing financial assistance to the neediest of Filipinos. So we don't know whether Marcos is the right man to shepherd the Philippines uh, throughout its economic recovery, but the needs remain urgent, uh, regardless of whether or not he's up to the job. You mentioned his predecessor, Duterte. How much does his legacy hang over, over Marcos when we're talking about his policies or about his rights abuses? Well, Duterte's signature policy, maybe let's start with that, is called Build, Build, Build. So he wanted to usher in the golden age of infrastructure. We did not quite get that. As we know, infrastructure is very hard to build. So among the 119 projects he had planned, only about 18 are uh, considered done or near done. But Marcos is, uh, is looking to continue these, this policy. It's very popular. He partly ran on a continuity candidate platform. In terms of China, he's thought to, uh, he's probably going to continue trying to woo Chinese investment, but probably with more of an eye towards balancing what have become very unpopular pro China policies with the desire for more Chinese money. But you've already said it, Duterte's legacy is complicated. You know, human rights, rule of law, these are the kinds of things that make investors nervous, make it look like the Philippines is unstable and run by an erratic leader. So Marcos has the opportunity to prove that. He's not just an extension of Duterte or an extension of his kleptocratic and corrupt father, but he's not given a sign that that's what he wants to achieve. Mm. What about the business community? How do they look at this? Marcos is going to be in power for the next six years. What do they expect? Well, in the run-up to the election, a lot of business leaders and economists actually supported Lenny Robredo, so Marcos Jr.'s nearest rival at the time. But if you look at how Marcos got elected, he, uh, he got the country's richest and most powerful families to rally behind him. It's undercovered, but Marcos Jr. is beloved of billionaires. Mm -hmm. When he... Uh, when he won the election. He threw a victory party with tycoons around him in a luxury hotel. And it's uncomfortable when you think of uh, his father's time and the era of cronyism that that heralded. So, you know, are business leaders looking forward to Marcos? I guess it depends on how close they are to him. But I am prepared to concede that is a distrustful reading of these affairs. All right. My colleague Chanel Dumoulin on the inauguration of Ferdinand Marcos Jr.